It would appear that the climate debate is over. Settled science has demonstrated that climate change is happening and that it is anthropogenically caused. In fact, the debate is not over. It's actually not begun because the real debate is not whether climate change is happening, but what will we do in response? And what I'm observing is that the debate is already forming up into several camps with very different worldviews. The primary two camps are, let's call them druids and engineers, but also waiting in the wings is a third group, call them astronauts. Now, beginning with the druids, the druids are by nature pessimists. They say the solution is to turn the clock back, to return the planet to, if not a pristine state, at least something before the Industrial Revolution. And the Archdruid, as he was so called by John McPhee in a book of the same name, was David Brower in the 1960s, very much focused on conserving and preserving. This was even before the climate debate emerged before we even knew that climate change was happening. And back then, David Brower put out an ad in the New York Times that summarized the Druid position perfectly. It called for the declaration of an Earth National Park, a wonderful utopian view. But it shows perfectly the view of the Druids. The only solution is to go back, to return to some previous state. And Druids generally tend to be geologists, earth scientists, biologists, and they all know that everything has an end. Biologists will tell you that no matter how long a species lives, eventually the individuals die and the species become extinct. And earth scientists will be the first to point out that even the tallest mountain, say Everest, its fate is to end up as a thick sand layer on the seabed of the Indian Ocean someday. So that's the view of the Druids. In stark contrast is the view of another camp. Let's call them engineers. And they say the solution to climate change is to innovate and to accelerate, to move more quickly into the future, to flee into the future and come up with an exponential solution to this problem. The Ur engineer arguably would be Buckminster Fuller, a pioneer and visionary who focused on engineering for the sake of the betterment of mankind, doing more with less, and above all, coming up with elegant solutions. More recently, I would point to Peter Diamandis as the quintessential engineer, uh, heading up the XPRIZE Foundation and also being the founder of Singularity University, saying the only answer here is to apply exponential technologies in an accelerating future. Engineers, in contrast to the Druids, engineers are by nature optimists. Their attitude is give them enough resources and enough money and they can solve just about anything. And they can be guaranteed to come up with a dramatic solution to the problem and deliver us all into a happy new world. We'll come back to the merits of each, but it's worth noting there's a third group. Let's call them astronauts. The pessimists say, let's go back. The engineers say, let's go forward. And the astronauts say, let's go off planet. Let's do a planetary reset. It is our inevitable fate to become an interplanetary species. If we don't, someday an asteroid will take us out. So we must go into space. It's an imperative. The godfather of the astronauts was the brilliant Gerard O'Neill at Princeton the first one to propose large-scale space colonies at the Lagrange points to build beautiful new spaces in space. And of course, up there, the view would be great and you'd have sunlight 24 hours a day. More recently, Elon Musk is among the leads of the astronautic proponents, suggesting that we should all go to Mars and push a reset button there. Not unlike the explorers of the Old West said, let's leave the mess behind, let's start anew just over the horizon. Now, the debate has a hundred year context behind it. And that's a problem for each one of the groups. Druids, for example, it's a beautiful vision they have, but it's a very utopian vision. And frankly, it's just too late. 
We've known about climate change for over a hundred years. Svante Arrhenius did the first calculation showing us the consequences of carbon dioxide partial pressure increases in the 1890s. If we had known it back then, well, maybe the Druid solution might have been possible. Though honestly, I suspect even that would be too optimistic. Thanks to Charles Keeling and the Keeling Curve, the 10,000 year plot of carbon dioxide partial pressures. And if you look at that vertical line off to the right, it's clear that if we wanted to go back the way the Druids proposed, we probably should have started 150 years ago or more uh, when the Industrial Revolution began. The Druids' vision seems like a very beautiful one until you get into the details, and then you realize it would create demands for absolutely horrendous social engineering. These are a couple of quotes from David Brower back in the 1960s, and as you can see with a straight face, he was proposing that one would require a license in order to have a child. A future that I think no one would want to be in, even if the grass was green and the trees provided plenty of shade and the oxygen was pure. The Druid's prescription is unpalatable. It's just too late to go down that path. So that leaves us with the engineers. And the engineers say, it's easy. We can put devices in the ocean that pump up gases that lighten the clouds and reflect more sunlight to cool the planet. Or we'll seed the ocean with iron filings in order to create a blankton bloom in the desert of the mid-ocean. It'll capture carbon in the form of plankton that sink to the abyssal plain and hold the carbon there for uh, millennia upon millennia. Or let's put sunshades at the Lagrange point. Uh, or let's put solar power generation in orbit. Take the power plants off of the planet and deliver the power via microwave. Of course, the problem with the engineer thinking is what could possibly go wrong? Dramatic solutions to problems inevitably lead to dramatically unexpected consequences. And after all, it was the engineers who got us in this fix by bringing us the Industrial Revolution. The other problem with the engineering solution is who gets to decide on which solution we apply? For example, is it a go it alone that anybody can do it as they want? This was a project in 2008, a company called Planktos. They were gonna sprinkle iron filings in the mid Pacific, note how much carbon was getting sequestered and then turn around and sell the carbon credits on Wall Street. Imagine, for example, some crazy mad scientist unilaterally comes up with a solution that makes life better for the country he happens to live in the middle latitudes, but brings on a new ice age further north. The Russians are kind of liking global climate change because it improves their wheat growing season. And if you suddenly return the client to the status quo ante, um, Russian wheat doesn't do so well and everybody is going to have a dog in that fight. So we simply don't have the global political structure, the decision structure to decide on who gets to engineer the, the Earth's atmosphere and who doesn't. That leaves us with a third option, the astronauts. And the astronauts say the solution is easy. Let's go into space. We are going to be a spacefaring species. Let's get out with the job. Let's move there. Let's set up colonies in Mars and, and in space stations. The problem is that, in my opinion, they're mistaking a clear view for a short distance. The technology is getting better. Uh, we can't really build large scale space stations yet, but let's argue for the sake of it that we will in the next 50 years. 50 years is, is way too late to solve this problem. And it would be impossible to move enough people off the planet to make a difference. Gravity's a bitch. There is no way around the fact that it takes enormous energy to get off planet and out of orbit. Illustrated perfectly by this picture of the Saturn V rocket, the total rocket stack is 110 meters high. And look at that little tiny dot of a capsule at the top. Everything underneath it, more than nine tenths of this rocket, was required just to get the rocket off the pad, through the atmosphere, and out of orbit. 
And that little tiny capsule at the top, it had everything it needed to get all the way to the moon and all the way back safely. That's the problem. Gravity is not just a good idea, it's the law. And climbing out of the gravity well is going to take a lot of energy, no matter how elegant our technology is. And it's going to take us a long time before we overcome that. And certainly we won't solve the problem of climbing out of the gravity well soon enough in order to be able to solve the climate crisis. And besides, as a friend of mine likes to observe, he says, you know, it just doesn't make sense colonizing Mars. Why am I gonna go to all the trouble of climbing out of the Earth's gravity well to spend several months in a tin can traversing the blackness of space only to go down the gravity well of another place, Mars, that looks about as appealing as the Mojave Desert in the middle of summer with half of the oxygen. So moving to space is a long-term likelihood, perhaps a long-term certainty if we survive, but short-term, it is not going to solve our climate problems. So the question is, where does the answer lie? How do we solve this debate? Are we going to spend a couple of decades arguing between druids, engineers, and astronauts in the same way we spent several decades arguing over the reality of climate change in the face of clear climate data? Or are we going to come up with a better answer? And when I look at all three camps, I feel a little bit like the story about Henry Kissinger, who in the first few days of the 1970s Arab-Israeli war was asked Dr. Kissinger, who'd you like to see win? And he paused and he thought about it and he said, you know, I think it would be nice if both sides lost. Well, I think this is a debate that all three sides of the argument need to lose, but they need to lose it only because all three sides have part of the answer. We need to come up with an answer to the debate that encompasses the elegant aesthetic of the Druids, the innovation imperative of the engineers, and the vision of the astronauts who say, the Earth is not a little capsule, that the edge of our atmosphere is actually standing on the edge of a vast ocean of space that's a source of potential resources to help us solve this problem. Which leaves us with a fourth possible option in terms of framing the debate. And the fourth option is the metaphor of a gardener or perhaps a farmer. A gardener would say, hmm, the planet is screwed up enough that I can't go back to wilderness. So I'm going to have to tend to it. But they also have the modesty and patience of a gardener saying, you know, I better not make any big moves here because big moves usually mess up my garden. That a gardener's perspective is a humble, long-term perspective that says the solution, the path out of our problems is a series of small moves. Small moves, look at the results, combine small moves together for big effects, but above all, be patient and let the land tell you what it wants. And if you had to pick one person who would be the quintessential of a good gardener, a patient gardener, I would choose Masanobu Fukuoka. He is well known in India and is an individual who said, let us be patient. Let us treat gardening as a spiritual practice. And he had deep sensitivities to our current problem today, even though he spoke so long ago. One of my favorite quips of his was, if we throw mother nature out the window, she will just come back in the door with a pitchfork. And above all, before researchers become researchers, they must become philosophers. I think finding a solution of what to do in the face of the climate crisis requires us all to become a little bit of a philosopher, a lot bit of a gardener, and to listen to the best ideas from the Druids, 
the engineers, and even the astronauts. And keep in mind that at the end of the day, we're working not to save the present, we're working to save the future for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. An observation neatly summed up in a statement that Jonas Salk made in the mid-1960s. Our greatest responsibility is to become good ancestors. And that's what we all need to keep in mind as we tackle the immediate, urgent needs of finding a solution to rampant climate change. <music>